Hey everybody, I'm Amy Clark with the SeniorList.com and today, um, today is April 8th in 2020. So the thing that is on the top of everyone's mind every day for the last month, two months, and the foreseeable future is COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, I'm here today with Nurse Cynthia, and we are going to talk about COVID and the age of um, senior housing and older adults themselves, um, how people are coping with COVID. So let's get started. Uh, just yeah. cut through any chit chat in the beginning. Um, thank cool. you, Cynthia, for joining us. Thank you um, for having me. Yeah, you always, we appreciate your insight and your knowledge always. So I, this is going to be a, a bit of an extensive uh, video, I have a feeling. So uh, my, my first question is, um, with, with so many older adults who are isolated right now, whether that's in a care setting or whether that's in their own home, um, what are some of the ways that families can be supporting them during this difficult time? Great question. Thank you. Yes, this is um, a particularly challenging time. Um, and, and our seniors and our loved ones um, need us now more than ever. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's one of the best things I read was it's important to socially distance without um, socially isolating mm -hmm. our loved ones. And so it's, it's finding that balance, which is, is, can be tricky when you have loved ones living um, far away from you and then in um, a community that's perhaps on lockdown. And so very challenging times for all of us. And, um, you know, with each event that comes up in our, in our world like this, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a learning curve. It's a huge learning curve and it's very challenging. And so the, the really important thing I think for all of us, but our, our senior loved ones um, in particular, um, you know, that social, that feeling of social isolation um, just has a tremendous and can have a tremendous negative impact on not only our physical health, um, but our emotional health as well. Um, but thankfully, there, you know, we're all getting really creative out here and sharing information and finding um, wonderful ways that, that we can support one another and, and support our seniors out there. Yeah. You know, something you said made me think, um, you've told me in the past, you know, this is not the first time I've ever had to lock down a building. You, mm -hmm. having worked in assisted living for so long, this this isn't necessarily the first time that uh, older adults in, in nursing facilities and assisted living have mm -hmm. to be in isolation and, and the building has to be locked down. So can you just touch on that briefly? Um, oh, I, yeah. experience with, you know, this is not the first go around for you. Definitely, um, you know, we've, we've had times in um, assisted living, the assisted living community that I worked in for over 16 years, where we made the difficult decision, um, but definitely the right decision to, to lock things down and to, to try to, um, you know, isolate as much as possible within our community. And, um, you know, most memorable for me was, you know, when we had the Noro outbreak. Mm. And, and we've seen various types of that situation, you know, repeat through, um, through the years for probably the last four or five years. And then just scenarios where we know we have had um, the seasonal flu. And so, um, you know, for some, some areas and some communities, this this is um, maybe the, the first time they've had to experience this. I've, I've gone through this several times, you know, four or five times before um, while working in assisted living. And, and now it's, you know, certainly having a, a global impact. Um, but but it's, it's been proven. I've seen it myself. As soon as we lock down a building and we start um, being very cautious about food delivery and activity and you know, keeping people um, socially distanced. We've seen that cases of noro and things like that have um, improved. And so uh, it's, it, seeing it on a global level is very interesting. But um, some folks out there that have had loved ones in 
um, possibly memory care or assisted living have, have experienced this to some level before in the past. Mm. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's important to keep in mind. Uh, I know that people are getting really creative with mm-hmm. keeping in touch with loved ones. I know that I am calling my grandmother a lot more than I have in the past, Yay. Yeah, which is great. It can be a bit of a challenge for someone who is cognitively impaired to mm-hmm. understand why we aren't visiting with her at all. That's been a challenge. Um, I know other families, and I would love to do this with my grandmother, but she also has macular degeneration, so she can't see. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I I know other families are doing some really creative things with FaceTime and Skype, um, you know, to to be able to still have some sort of personal connection. Of course, talking on the phone. I think in the news, we've all seen the, the videos and pictures of people, you know, talking with each other through a window on the phone. Um, what are some of the things that you are seeing or hearing about that, that facilities themselves are doing to, um, to help the people in their care feel less isolated? There's a lot of great things going on out there. I think, first of all, like you said, more on a personal level, just making sure that we're checking in with our loved ones as as often as possible. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this morning how um, seniors are often living with a certain degree of social isolation outside of COVID in their daily lives. Um, if they're hearing impaired, their vision impaired, their mobility impaired, um, you know, the cognitively impaired, oftentimes on a daily basis, even in the best situations, they're dealing with certain levels of, of social isolation. Um, and so, so then you put something like this on top of it, and it's very confusing, it's disorienting, it's stressful. And so, so now those those things that they were able to enjoy in their day have been impacted. And so there's a further degree of social isolation. Our seniors need us now more than ever. They really do. Um, You know, many of them are not able to go out and eat meals with their table mates. Their activities within their communities um, have been changed and are being done in different Different ways and those little things that they used to gauge their day on you know breakfast lunch and dinner with with a friend um, going out for a walk going to bingo all of those things have been impacted mm-hmm. which just adds another layer to um, already so many issues that they're dealing with physically and emotionally and mentally and so really making sure that we're, we're keeping in touch with our loved ones and um, easier said than done in some situations, like you were saying with your grandma, um, you know, sometimes talking on a phone can be confusing mm-hmm. and trying to Skype and FaceTime and do all those things can be very difficult. Um, but, but really just trying to get creative. Um, a phone call, sometimes just a phone call, morning and evening, every day can be that one thing that that person is looking forward to, to brighten their day, to, to orient them to morning and night when all their normal activities are just sort of blending together. Like they and are for all of us right now. They are. It's a, what, what's breakfast versus lunch versus dinner? It's happening at different times. And, you know, um, it, it can add to um, in cognitive impairment, you know, and it, it can increase their cognitive impairment because they don't have those cues throughout mm-hmm. their day that would orient them normally. They're not, they're not getting up and going out. So maybe they're not even like many of us getting dressed every day. And so um, really being aware of, of where, where they are in, in their world um, and just trying to, to find some ways to, to bring them some joy and, and some company. Um, I think that um, encouraging them to do things that they enjoy, that you know that they like to enjoy um, doing, which is like reading a book or doing a crossword or asking them about those things. Are you reading a book right now? Are you working on some of your crosswords? Are you knitting? Um, you know, hey, have you, have you watched, you know, any great movies lately and sort of cueing them and encouraging them to, to keep going and to find different ways to fill their time? Because for, um, 
for seniors that are active in their assisted living community um, or in their community at large, um, you know, this, this can be a very challenging situation for them. Some folks are very introverted and, and they might not notice a big change in their day, mm -hmm, yeah. but, but they know that there's a lot of things going on out there and they're worried about their health and their life and the, their, their, their families. Um, and so it, it's a trying time. I think one important thing to do is just to really ask them, hey, how are you? How are you feeling physically? And how are you feeling emotionally? How are you dealing with all of this? Mm -hmm. And giving them um, an opportunity to really talk about what they might be feeling. Because just having, um, I, know, I know for me personally, just having someone to talk to about the stress you feel one day and maybe the depression you feel the next day helps it pass a little bit. Mm -hmm. So when you're checking in on them, ask them how they're feeling physically. Ask them how they're feeling emotionally send cards, send pictures, letters. You know, you can have family members that are young, maybe do some sort of an art project for them. And those little surprises in the mail, you know, that's the one thing that's pretty consistent right now is, the, you know, that we're all getting our mail. And so um, sending them a, a picture, a copy of a picture that you can print off for them or something might give them, you know, just that little extra boost um, to their day. And then I've also seen folks, um, asking others, hey, would you mind sending my grandpa a card, yeah. you know, and just reaching out to your circle and your community and, and um, asking folks to kind of pitch in to help our, our loved ones um, feel important and not forgotten. Uh, and, and in that regard, I do want to say that um, it, it is important. There's a lot of information about out there about how COVID is spread and how it's not spread and how long it can last. And you know, anytime that you are handling anything that um, is, is going to, um, you know, a high risk population, such as our seniors, um, just or anybody in general, really make sure that you, you know, disinfect a surface that you're, you're working on, wash your hands before um, you prepare that card and, and just be extra, extra cautious um, for our seniors because they are um, at risk. Um, and another thing is, is really, you know, it's okay to reach out to your community that, that your loved one might be living in to find out kind of how you can support them mm -hmm. um, and what things are being done. And, and then that way you, you, you can help where you can and you can have um, something to talk with your loved one about, you know, because there's a lot of really fun things going on out there in the, in the senior communities um, to try and help keep people's spirits up and um, uh, a really important thing as well is um, making sure that your loved one has um, the supplies that they need. Mm. And a lot, a lot of folks, um, you know, would go out weekly shopping and get all their supplies and they don't have access to that right now. And so uh, making sure that they have snacks, their favorite snacks, beverages, toiletries, personal items, books, um, things to help them stay busy. So um, it's a really wonderful way to kind of reach out to your, your senior loved one and let them know you care and, and help them kind of pass the time. And then as you said, I know here in the state of Oregon, um, they are asking that communities assist um, residents with staying connected via Skype or FaceTime. And so um, if you have any questions about that, please reach out to your community and, and ask them if, if they can help you Skype. Your loved one doesn't have to know anything about how to set up Skype or FaceTime. Mm -hmm. And the communities are, are providing that um, for their residents. So, Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I was just texting with um, the adult care home that my grandmother lives in this morning mm -hmm. about doing a FaceTime um, because it does require that staff takes the time to yes. set that up and hold the phone and, you know, make sure that that's all going well. So mm -hmm. not that's challenging for me <laughs> <laughs> and not something that we want to ask of her to do all the time, but um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that she has agreed to do that, which, which is awesome for us as a family. Um, so by now, most people, most older adults especially, know that they need to stay socially isolated in order to protect themselves. Um, 
what kinds of, what other types of precautions should older adults be thinking about that um, they may not necessarily think about? You mentioned taking things to um, a loved one's home and dropping, dropping them off like supplies. So let's just take that as an example. What types of precautions, once they receive those supplies, do they need to take into account to protect themselves um, even in their own home. That's a really good point. Um, I think that, I mean, obviously we all know, but, but to be redundant, our seniors really need to be going out of the house as little as possible. And so making sure, um, like I said a few minutes ago, that they, they have the things they need and oftentimes it can be a little bit easier for um, our senior loved ones that are living in a community. You know, they've got, they've got a lot of food there, they've got some activities going on there um, to varying degrees, um, but our, our loved ones, our senior loved ones that are living out in their homes um, need to stay protected. And so making sure that we're finding ways to help them get medications refilled they you know they might have been going to their local pharmacy and if we can go pick those up for them or help them get those set up mail order that's a, you know really great way making sure that obviously they have food and flu fluids and supplies um, and if if at all we can get those things for them and bring them to their home to limit um, you know them going out into the community that that is the ideal situation. Um, there, there isn't any way to avoid all risk. Um, you know, we are, we are needing to bring medications into our home or needing to bring food and fluids and, and, um, you know, toiletry items and things like that into our home. And so, um, limiting exposure out in the grocery store in the community is, is the most important thing, but also just being careful as to you know how we're delivering things to our older adults and making sure that if we're going out and we're taking something to their home that we're, we're washing our hands before and after um, being very careful when delivering things to their home that um, you know we we're wearing a mask and um, protecting ourselves protecting ourselves is going to help protect them um, a lot of a lot of people now are wearing masks at all time whenever they they leave their front door and I think that that is absolutely an excellent idea. So even if you're going to the grocery store for your loved one, wash your hands before and after, wear your mask, gather their supplies, bring them to their house, uh, social distance, you know, drop those supplies off. And then some really wonderful kind of um, extra steps for protection is just making sure that um, you know bringing as little from the outside community into the house as possible and then what needs to come in um, you know try to remove those things from the original packaging yeah. I saw a great uh, YouTube video from a doctor who who really just kind of showed a simple procedure of um, you know you have your counter space where you're bringing items into the house and you know divide that counter into kind of your clean side and your dirty side disinfect it put your put your groceries your prescriptions what have you on one side of that counter and then take everything out of the packaging move it over to the cleaner side of the counter dispose of those uh, of that packaging and um, try to transfer things you know for instance if you have cereal in a box you can always take the bag of cereal out of the box, discard the box, and trying to get things um, placed in clean containers as much as possible. And certainly this isn't to, to initiate more fear and paranoia, but it's just to allow us, if there's small steps that we can take, to be careful, um, making sure that we're doing those. Um, wash your fruits and vegetables. Wash your hands before and after, you know, handling things that have come in from the community. Um, sanitized surfaces that have touched things that have come in from the community and um, you know be, be as vigilant as you can you know to to protect your health a lot of the data and information that that we're receiving on the spread of this virus is changing in real time yeah so we're, we're learning things after the fact 
Yeah. And so um, I, I don't think that you can be too careful. You certainly want to stay sane and you don't want to be, you know, overwhelmed with paranoia. But um, if in any way possible, you know, if you're able to have a senior that's protected inside their home, keeping that home clean and sanitized and um, as healthy as possible is, is your best bet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if, if an older adult, whether they're living in an independent home setting or in a mm -hmm. community starts feeling unwell, what are the steps they need to take and at what point do they need to be concerned mm -hmm. about their health? Yes, um, these, these challenging times leave us wondering. I mean, we're all wondering if we get a sniffle or a cough or yeah. you know, we start to feel unwell if, if something's coming. And so um, I think that, you know, it's, it's been pretty clear out there in the healthcare community that we want to avoid um, accessing care within a hospital um, when, when at all possible, because that's, that's where all, all of this is being treated, you know, that we keep hearing it referred to as the front line. And so that's the most dangerous place for folks to go. Um, in assisted facilities, what I'm seeing is when, you know, they're, they're checking people's temperatures, monitoring for symptoms on a regular basis. Um, once they've identified that there's some possible symptoms, for instance, maybe a fever um, or somebody's developed a cough, making sure that they're isolating um, the caregivers and, you know, personal protective equipment and, um, but keeping that person safe and in their home and monitoring, monitoring them very carefully and not just instantly sending them out to the ER um, it, because there, it could be suspected COVID. Um, and so I, I think that the key is, is that symptoms that can be safely managed at home should be managed at home. Mm -hmm. And the only time that um, we should be, any of us should be accessing um, emergency medical care or ER or urgent care um, is when things really start to progress and they can't be managed at home. Um, difficulty breathing, you know, that's, that's not something that you can manage in the home. But a low-grade fever, you can take some Tylenol for. Mm. A cough, um, we can certainly manage a cough in the home with cough medication over the counter. Um, but once somebody starts to have the difficulty breathing, the high fevers that, that, that can't be treated, um, you know, the shortness of breath, and then um, for our older adults, that change in, a men in mental status, too, can be a, a really key indicator that they, they might need to seek emergency care. I think prior to, to going to the hospital or prior to calling 911, um, we definitely need to, and before those sy symptoms become unmanageable, reach out to your primary care provider. Urgent cares, um, primary care providers, many health insurance companies have online advice nurses. Mm. And so um, it, it's, it's never too early if you're worried and you're concerned reach out, ask your questions, get some information, and, um, you know, discuss kind of the plan moving forward with your care provider. Um, sometimes prescriptions can be phoned in for a cough. Um, and, and it's also very important to kind of let your care provider know where you're at and that you're even having symptoms. So I, I think that that's key. Um, we certainly want people to be cared for and, and get the, you know, the help that they need, but um, try to find that balance and keep them as safe as possible. Yeah, for sure. Um, as difficult as a topic, um, th this part of the question that I'm going to ask you, as difficult as it is, I think it's incredibly important. Um, and as we were talking about earlier, it's, it's something that you're seeing more and more even on the news, is, is talking with your loved ones about things like, do you want to be resuscitated? Mm -hmm. um, do you have a power of attorney to make decisions for you if you're no longer able to make decisions for yourself? Do you have a will? Th th these are very broad uh, pre-planning mm -hmm. topics that are meant to have happened years ago. Yes. Many people don't make these types of decisions, but what would be your recommendation for people who don't have any pre-planning in place? Um, 
who may have not had these types of conversations with their parent Mm -hmm. uh, or each other. I I know spouses who haven't had these conversations with each other, who who don't have their will set up, who don't have a power of attorney set up. So share your your insight and, and words of wisdom. For us Definitely there. no better time than the present. Um, you know, to, ha- to at least at a bare minimum, have dialogue with your loved one about what they want and what they don't want. And, um, and start talking about that now. It might not be the most realistic time to start trying to get everything in place as far as setting up an advanced directive. Or, or getting a will established, but at least at a minimum, having, having that dialogue, it's okay to ask those difficult questions. Yes, it, it, you know, it, it does bring on a little bit of sadness, you know, and it is a, a difficult topic, but it's very important. And, um, it, you know, when, when somebody is sick, we really need to be able to focus on taking care of them and taking care of ourselves and not having to second guess the decisions that we're making and and not have to worry if we're making the right decisions for our loved ones. And so just having a basic conversation about different scenarios. Um, You know, some folks are very black and white, you know, some, some older gentlemen, they, they, you know, they'll tell me straight, straight up, just, you know, Oh, if, if it's my time, I'm ready to go, you know, and, and I think a lot of us, when we think about our dads and things, um, we think, oh, yeah, you know, I think I might know what dad might want. Um, so just, just es- establishing, you know, some of those, those basic wishes that, that a bare minimum, that's what we need to be doing right now. And, and asking how people feel about um, going on a ventilator. You know, um, we're, we're hearing a lot about that. It's, it's out in the media, media it's out in the news. Um, and some people are very adamant that that's not something that they would want for themselves. Mm-hmm. And it's okay to ask that question. And it's okay, um, you know, to, to hear what their response is, you know. And, and then um, as we start to, to move out of this COVID time, um, you know, hopefully this will be a, a reminder for us all to make sure that, at, you know, of all ages, that, you know, we, we have a will in place, um, we have an advanced directive, we've discussed our wishes, because when someone's sick or when we lose someone, um, we really need to be focusing on caring for ourselves, caring for our loved one, and, and then sometimes grieving. And it, it can be a very difficult time to try to make very difficult decisions if we don't have that, that information that we need. Yeah, and I, I really do look at it as a gift, that someone can give to their family and their loved ones to be able to say, this is what I want. This is what I don't want. You know, here's how I want to be treated in this scenario. You know, here's who I want to make these decisions for me. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have your family members trying to figure that out in the heat of the moment in a, in a crisis scenario. It's just, it's incredibly unfair to them. So um, I, I, I second your recommendations that people need to get something in place, even if it's the bare bones for now, having a power of attorney, having a conversation with your loved ones about what you want. And then on down the road, if it makes sense to, you know, have a more formal, you know, wills drawn up and, and um, advanced directives and all of that good stuff, then, then so be it. But yes, at least some basics put in place now, I think behooves all of us. It does. And it's a difficult conversation from a, from a, a, a parent's viewpoint. They might not want to bring that up with their children because they might worry that their children um, will get upset, you know. And I know, I think I, I always see it on both ends of the spectrum. You know, the family members or the children are afraid to ask and the parent or the loved one is afraid to say, and everybody's just kind of left it unspoken. Yeah. And then once, once the conversation comes up, um, oftentimes it's a lot more comfortable than you might think it would be as long as everyone is open. Um, but just start that dialogue early. That seems to be the, the, the key thing that we're constantly repeating in our videos is, yes. you know, but early. prepare early, talk about things. Yeah. 
have conversations, mm-hmm. even though they're uncomfortable. It's, it's way better than the alternative of trying to have them or not being able to have them. Yes. In some crisis. And you can even say, hey, I saw this video. Yeah. Blame it on us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need to and you talk about this. said, I need to have this conversation with you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, I, that wraps it up for me for the questions I had for you. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for talking to us and our, our visitors um, about these sensitive and generally tough topics. Yeah. You do it with grace and, and a lot of knowledge and your expertise is very um, appreciated. So thank you thank so much. Thank you. It's my pleasure to share the information and hopefully help some people out. And um, I just I send everybody blessings and well wishes and stay safe out there. Yeah, likewise. Uh, stay safe yourself and we'll talk to you again soon. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.